Welcome to a new series that I'd like to try, This Month in Dinosaurs. At the end of every month, I'll try to make an episode summing up all of the paleontological news that has been made that month, and I will make sure to provide links to the technical articles and any related sources so that you can do more research on your own. I apologise if I have left out any discoveries, please let me know in the comments anything I miss. I hope you enjoyed the first episode of This Month in Dinosaurs. Probably the most publicised piece of news from this month was the formal naming and description of that new huge titanosaur that was unveiled in 2014. Now called Patagotitan Maiorum, it seemed that every media outlet on the internet was hailing this animal as the biggest dinosaur ever. But this turned out to be not quite true, as Matt Waddell pointed out in an SV Pal post, in which he compared some of the measurements of Argentinosaurus, another huge titanosaur, and Patagotitan. The bones of Patagotitan are in fact slightly smaller than Argentinosaurus, and for now, as Matt Waddell said, it's safer to say that Patagotitan joins a group of supersized sauropods that also includes Argentinosaurus and another giant, Puertosaurus. However, Patagotitan is definitely the most complete of the three, providing a lot of important and useful information about these amazing creatures. It's also important to remember that due to the low number of individuals represented by the fossils we have, these comparisons are not entirely representative of the species as a whole, and we are simply comparing individuals to other individuals. Also this month, the fantastic nodosaur that was unveiled at the Royal Tyrell Museum earlier this year received a name and formal description. Boreal Apelta Mark Mitchelly which means Northern Shield, and honours the years of work done by Mark Mitchell to prepare the specimen for display, was incredibly well preserved, and I myself have been lucky enough to see it on display, as well as when it was still being prepared two years ago. The specimen preserves the animal almost exactly as it would have looked in life, with barely any distortion to the upper part of its body caused by the fossilisation process. The description paper reports evidence for countershading in this animal, which is a type of coloration seen in modern animals in which they have dark colours on the top part of their bodies, but light colours on the underside part. This pattern helps smaller animals today to evade predators, since it breaks up the outline of their bodies and so aids in camouflage. Therefore, the idea that Boreal Apelta, a large, heavily armoured animal, may have employed the use of countershading has some interesting implications for the predator-prey relationships of the Cretaceous. The paper suggests that the presence of countershading indicates a strong selection pressure driven by predation for this animal to evolve such a coloration. It therefore says that the Mesozoic would have been very different to modern ecosystems, partly due to the presence of very large, visually oriented theropods hunting animals such as Boreal apelta. Another interesting development this month involved the naming of a new troodontid dinosaur that also resulted in the resurrection of an old name that has been out of use for decades, as well as the suggestion that we should stop using the name Truridon. We welcome the arrival of newly named Latinivinatrix McMasteri, which is based on a partial skeleton as well as a few other specimens that include fragmentary remains of the skull and limbs. But the authors also report that there is in fact a second species of Truodontid in the Dinosaur Provincial Park formation in Alberta, and they use the name Stenonychosaurus for the second animal, a name that has been out of use since the 80s. And, since the name Troodon has been used to describe all sorts of bones from all over North America, but originally applied to a single tooth, the authors have suggested that the name be discarded, at least until perhaps more complete remains are found that match the original tooth. This development could also now allow many more species of Troodontid dinosaurs to be named in the future. You might remember that earlier this year there was a fairly major change that happened to the dinosaur family tree, in which theropods were moved from being closely related to sauropods to being more closely related to ornithischians, forming a new group called Ornithoskeleda. I made a video about this change a few months ago if you'd like to learn about it in more detail. Well, this month saw the publication of more support for this new family tree, by the same authors who came up with the original change for the tree. Chilisaurus has been confusing scientists for a while, since its description in 2015. It was first thought to be a member of Titanuri, a group of theropod dinosaurs, but this new paper reclassifies it as a basal ornithischian. 
This is important to providing support to the new family tree, because Chilisaurus displays features of both theropods and ornithischians, and so, as the authors say, Chilisaurus slots exactly in between the two groups. It is a perfect half-and-half -half mix. Although the new tree does have its critics, support such as this does seem to make it more compelling, and it also helps to make better sense of what Chilisaurus is itself. Next is the publication of yet another small fluffy theropod from China, Ceracornis, nicknamed Silky after the feathers it would have displayed in life. These feathers are actually what make this new dinosaur so significant, since it had different types of feathers on different parts of its body. Most importantly, Ceracornis had fluffy feathers, but also pinaceous feathers, similar to those seen in Microraptor, on its back legs indicating that the gliding using four wings method originated on the ground, as Ceracornis was in fact a terrestrial animal and could not have flown. These feathers probably evolved for another reason entirely, possibly as a display function, and were later used for flying by animals such as Microraptor. Finally, I would also like to cover the release of Saurian onto Steam. If you haven't heard of Saurian yet, it's a game that aims to be a realistic simulation of the famous North American Hell Creek Formation, featuring many well-known dinosaurs such as T-Rex, Triceratops, and Pachycephalosaurus. At the moment, the only playable dinosaur is the fairly recently discovered Dakotaraptor, a large dromaeosaur, but the list of playables is set to extend. You're able to live the life of a dinosaur from when it is first born to an adult, with intermediate growth stages between them, as you grow into a sub-adult and then an adult, but only if you are able to survive for that long in the first place. The game is fairly brutal to baby Dakotaraptors, but this reflects the mortality rates in these types of dinosaurs, with most individuals probably dying in their first year. The game will be updating regularly and I'm excited to see it develop over the next few years. I would recommend buying this game if you're interested in this sort of thing, since it is the most accurate dinosaur game out there at the moment, which is something I think we've been needing for a long time. Thank you for watching this month's summary of Dinosaur News. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please let me know if I've missed anything, I'll try to cover it next time instead. Also, remember that you can subscribe to see more videos like this one, and so that you don't miss next month's news.